Welcome to Two Month Review, our weekly podcast in which we talk about a single book, bit by bit, section by section, for a period of two months. Um, this is Chad. I'm here in live with Brian, so he can actually have to pay attention to the intro for once. Dang it. <laughs> and, and for the past couple of months, we've been reading Gorgi Gospodinov's Physics of Sorrow, which we, we technically, this is supposed to be our last episode um, for the book itself. We had one last next week for conclusions, which I'll talk about later. Um, but Brian didn't read, do the reading. It's like a normal book club member. Yes, I did. I read all the way to page 275. <laughs> Which is like two pages away from then. Well, I'll tell you what. With how boring your intros are, I could probably finish by the time you do all the boring stuff. <laughs> it's probably true. Why don't you introduce our amazing guest today? Our amazing guest is Stiliana uh, Nick. Wow, I screwed <laughs> up. I knew I was going to do this. Milkova, um, who is from Oberlin College, not university. And welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Chad and Brian. I, it's really good to have you on here because I know that you were very enthusiastic to, to come on and talk about, about this book. And I, when I went to, to look up your email address to make sure I had everything right to call you, I realized that we talked about this three years ago. We did. I think when I reviewed it originally, I sent you the review. Yeah, yeah, so that's, yeah. Actually, that's why I read it. I reviewed it for this wonderful blog. It's a website reading and translation, and so I contacted you because we had met a long time ago at the, uh, at the, um, remind me, the, the, the translators, the bread loaf translators yeah. conference, which I like to call translation loaf. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that that's a, I think that's a better name, like hundred percent better name. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, that, that's what I found. I was like, oh my god, all these pieces are coming together now. I recognize all of it. So. That's cool that you're here. I'm excited to be here. And I know we want to talk about the book, but we were talking a minute before this started about what you, what's your, what, what, what do you teach at Oberlin? What's your, your field of study? So my field of study is I teach comparative literature, and I am assistant professor of comparative literature at Oberlin College. I did my PhD on 19th century Russian and Bulgarian literature. But I now know. I teach Russian, Italian, English, a mix of other literatures, or more generally, world li literature. I saw on, on your bio that you had something about uh, Russian formalist erotic poetry. Yeah, you know, I saw that that's, that's one of the things you mentioned, but this is from 15 years ago. It was my first graduate school paper. <laughs> it is literally, it's your Oberlin bio. It's right there. It's like, well, that's an interesting one. <laughs> like, how well, can you talk published and everything, but I know it sounds sexy, right? So it catches attention. Yes, there you go. Know. That's what I was, yeah. Looking for, we're looking for views, man. We're looking for views. <laughs> Use whatever we can get. Um, but then I also noticed on there, which I thought was interesting, so you even mentioned it, that you're teaching Italian stuff now, is that you've yes. been doing a lot with Elena Ferrante. I am, yes. Yeah, I've, been, I've written five or six scholarly articles on her. I've also translated, co-translated an article by Anita Raya, who is rumored to be Elena Ferrante. I will be teaching an entire course on Elena Ferrante. So I'm definitely involved, to put it in that way, with Elena Ferrante. How did you get involved in that? Or what what was your interest? I read one of her books. I was in Italy seven or eight years ago, and I read one of her books, and I was hooked. I really, really liked it. So I bought all of her books that were out at that point, read them, devoured them literally, and then just I've been interested in her ever since. And you say you say allegedly the Elena Fronte. Wasn't there the article in the New York Review of Books a couple a year ago or so that? Yes. And then that's who you that's. That's who you're referring to, right? Yes, exactly. That supposedly uncovered her identity. I, it's so funny because I, I remember when that came out and I sort of read it, but not really because I didn't really care about who, I didn't care about her identity. I read all the books. Right, exactly, that's fine, exactly. Right? And I, to this day, don't remember what that name no, is. No, I'm taking that as you're saying you don't care about her <laughs> literature, just, the books. I read all of them. I read all except for... Cut it up and start the book. podcast with Chad doesn't <laughs> care about Elena Ferrante. <laughs> <laughs> Which do you have any do you have any good hot takes on the um on the TV show that's coming? No, I know I've I've you've so, I've seen probably the first shots or the images of the two actresses. Mm -hmm. That's all I know. I supposedly Ferranti is collaborating on the script. Oh really? That's that's positive. Because it's coming up from HBO, right? HBO, yes, exactly. And and I think it's right, the Italian national te television right. as well. Exactly. It's a huge deal. Yeah, we'll see. So, yeah. 
So what are your initial thoughts on Physics of Sarah? I mean, you've read it before. I don't know if you read it again. I reread the section for today. I didn't reread the yeah. whole book, but I flipped right. through, you know, you learn how to skim through books. So I skimmed the book and then reread carefully the section for today. I'm pretty pretty sure that's like Academia 101. <laughs> like when we <laughs> like, here's how to skim through a book to get just the content you need. Yeah, except no one really teaches you that. You have to figure it out. You know, year two or three of grad school, you realize you can't possibly read everything. Always read the intro, and then if you need one of the chapters, look at that later. Exactly, or index. Index also index. is very important. Well, Harold Bloom said. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So this is a fun section. So there's uh, technically, I guess, three sections to this part today, um, which just for anyone who's listening, we went through uh, part eight, an elementary physics of sorrow, which starts on 237, and then chapter nine endings, and then there's a, a last epilogue that's basically mirroring the prologue. And that was one of the things that struck me when I first started looking at this again, is that there's a lot of mirroring going on between the first chapter being the bread of, is it the bread of sorrow? Yeah, the bread of sorrow, um, and then an elementary yes. physics of sorrow, the exactly. prologue that has all the like, I was born, and this one has I was ending. And mm -hmm. so it's kind of cool to see those things sort of play out. And it is, this one is, this is the section that I think is my absolute favorite. Like, I really enjoy this book. I enjoy going through it. But when it all sort of kind of spiraled down into this bit that has a lot to do with both melancholy and with ideas of, of God and existence and death, like, this really just strikes home for me. And this is my, blows me away. There's a page in here that I'll get to later that, like, if we had read this page, I don't care what the rest of the book would have been, we would publish this book. Oh, wow. Really great. I want to know which one it is. We'll get there. We'll get there. Okay. <laughs> I have I have one quick question though. So yeah. you always get the question, people ask you, what are you reading? And I'm not sure how to tell people what I'm reading when I'm reading The Physics of Sorrow. Mm -hmm. How would you describe the book to somebody? That's a really good question. How might I pitch it to my students, let's say? Yeah. Well, let's say that. Um, it's, I would say, you know, it's, it's kind of a, well, first of all, it's a semi autobiography. So there's always that kind of intriguing aspect of it, but also I would say it, it kind of maps and tracks so events in Eastern Europe in the last maybe hundred years. So it's kind of a history of Eastern Europe, but it's also imaginative. It's nonlinear, it's fragmentary. So it's postmodern in that way. So it might, might appeal to people who are interested in postmodern, nonlinear, not sort of super plot based narrative. So that's that's how I, and I would say that it's really based also in, in ancient mythology and it's kind of excavating, digging up some fundamental images from our culture and general Western culture. Yeah, there's. Remember when we did for um for uh, uh, Rodrigo's book for Rodrigo for Zion's invented part was the first season of the two month review, and we did a rewrite of all the jacket copy. <laughs> yeah, oh, that'd, yeah. that'd be fabulous. Exactly. I don't even we know. So, yes. I don't know what it says either. I'm, I never read these things anymore because I always feel a embarrassed because I write them usually or oh, have help writing them and then b also like i feel like they just taint my reading of everything like i'm reading a different book right now for um these weekly columns i've been writing and it's uh it's like a sci-fi thing set in japan in the future and i'm reading and i'm like i don't know if this is good or not and i think i'm leaning towards not and then on the back it, i was looked at the back today it says confused over the name of a character and it says like a hysterical like very light and funny novel it's like none of this is funny and like i now i have like a whole new problem of like maybe i've just been misreading this entire book and like not getting it so i always avoid yeah, you don't like, know who, yeah yeah i don't you don't necessarily have to trust what the book jacket says this made me think of um it's an old movie from the 90s but uh Fargo by the Coen brothers. Oh yeah. And it's this weird, crazy story, but it begins with based on a true story. Mm, oh, right, mm -hmm. right. Even though it never, they just invented that. <laughs> they thought it sounded good to put, like just like their trick was like, yeah, just put based on a true story and it'll wrap oh, people in more. That's true. Yeah. And I love this book because I don't know what's real and not what real and yeah. everything blurs and kind of, I found myself just getting more immersed because I want to find out what's real or not real. And I really enjoyed the fact that it did have some autobiographical parts to it. Right. Yes, definitely. But the fragmentary nature is what I really like. And I guess that's really, now looking at this, that's sort of what we leaned into was just talking about 
the structure of it, that it's not linear, that you can get lost on these side side corridors, that it's using the, the myth of the Minotaur as like a principle organizing it, but that it spins out into stories that are both like sad, like the one with his grandfather being left at the mill or like funny yeah. or whatever. Yes. So yes. It's like, we're describing the process of reading it and nothing about the book itself. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's good or bad. Well, it depends. It, it is a kind of architectural novel. It's an architectural text because it uses the metaphor of the rooms and corridors and of architectural structures in general, architectonics of history, but of sorrow as well. How it's mapped yeah, over yeah. different, you know, the geography of sorrow. It, he traces a map of sorrow throughout all of Europe. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And there's a whole section in here. Let me see if I can find it. Have it Jeez, just as I was having a good time, you guys got to get all smart That's about okay. architecture. That's okay. We're going to do a close reading. He, he, he's oh, great. Oh, Jeez, <laughs> like, You can have the times all the, all the <laughs> sections of this because either they're really good or they make me really uh, uneasy. Um, but there is that part about the parallels and the set setup of being side corridors, and it is mm -hmm. right. Where is I had this? I just looked through this right before I called you, and I had everything okay. mapped out. Um, uh, this is where we call stuff. So, okay, right here. It's on page two forty. It's one of the early sections in this when he begins talking about like the nature of the story and these the quanta of equivocation. Mm -hmm. um, there's a paragraph that's, alas, the story is linear, and you have to get rid of the detours every time, while at the side corridors. Mm -hmm. The classical narrative is an annulling of all the, of the possibilities that rain down on you from all sides. Before you fix its boundaries, the world is full of parallel versions and corridors. All possible outcomes potter about only in hesitation and indecisiveness. And quantum physics, filled with an indeterminacy and uncertainty, has proved this. Mm -hmm. Which I, I when I was in college, I was obsessed with like the idea of quantum physics and string theory and physical physics as like a sort of organizing metaphor, almost more so than the actual things. Because as much as I like math, I'm not good at it that mm -hmm. in that way. Um, only in like the dumb baseball way. Um, but uh, the idea of like quantum physics and what they're sort of being proved or it's proven through quantum physics mm -hmm. or imagined. Um, was really captivating to me, and, and, in, and especially in terms of even literature. And he references, like, has anyone ever developed a quantum physics of literature? And that was sort of like my dream as an undergrad, is to come up with some new scheme of, like, looking at books in that sort of light of this, this indecisiveness and possibilities and the observer being necessary and how that alters the way that things are. And I love all that. And that's what this section, too, like, really immediately was like, I feel really at home you here. You really feel yeah. sad. I did. I <laughs> felt really everywhere. Felt that goal. That's really sad, Jack. I know. That makes sense why you are the way you are then. If, <laughs> if you dreamed of this and you got to maybe here, here. instead of here, here. Yeah. That's gonna be. There's a lot of anger when you're down here. Yeah, there was the other. My, my other dream was to figure out how to be really good at marketing books. Oh, <laughs> oh boy. Like, with that's a new scheme that'll revolutionize the world. No, it's, I, I wrote the top of the um, Heisenberg at the top of uh, yeah. two thirty nine, right? And okay. it's, it's its impact on postmodern literature. Yep. Indeed, yes. Because it was talking about the observer, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And this idea of surveillance, observation, yeah. and that if we exist, that means we're being watched. So yes, exactly. That the very act of observation brings ourselves into being. Which is another reason why I believe that we live in a simulation. Mm -hmm. Oh, not that. What was that? Is that Derrida? The simulacra? Oh, that, no, yeah. That, Audrey that, are, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 no. I just mean literally <laughs> we are a sim. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. Or like, the matrix, <laughs> you know, another way. Yeah. The matrix, right? Yeah, the matrix. Exactly. Yeah. Like we're just we're just like someone's playing a game and just like <laughs> moving us around. There are very many times, way too many times where I'm like riding my bike and I see people doing something on the side of the street and I think Human beings wouldn't do that, like unless you were a computer program. Computer program would move like that, would do that thing, and this is why I, I, I believe we're not really here. I have the strangest ways of of connecting with this novel, uh, like in my um, in my MFA, I was taking a class on creative nonfiction, mm -hmm. and I wanted a way of, and I'd been doing a, a course on postmodernism as well, so I wanted to do a postmodern nonfiction. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I did one where I traveled back in time and saw myself as an adult in different situ um, as an adult as, right back as a child in different situations. Yeah. 
And the workshop on that piece, I got eviscerated by everybody. Like, you're not allowed to do that because how is this nonfiction if you're time traveling? You can't do that. Like, I'm like, well, what, what the hell is memory? Like, what do you mean I can't do this? Yeah. And I loved reading, like, him doing this. I was like, that's what I wanted to do, and I wasn't allowed to do it. And he just, like, those roles don't And he does it so effortlessly, and I'm on board with it. And it was, I had such a connection with it. Yeah, absolutely. It's breaking so many rules. Yes. Yeah. In fact, that quote that Chad read on, was it 240? That it describes the very novel, the novel itself. It says, you know, the, it's nonlinear and it's re refusing to wall up the side corridors in its mm -hmm. blurring boundaries rather than fixing them. So there is that wonderful moment of meta reflexivity. So yeah, he really part does of that. the postmodern poetics of this text, of course. Absolutely. And not to like, hammer home that one section too much but it, it is that paragraph that's really like life affirming or, or book affirming is i try to leave space for other versions to happen cavities in the story more corridors voices and rooms unclosed off stories mm -hmm. as well as awesome. secrets that we will not pry into and there where the story sin was not avoided hopefully uncertainty was with us which yes. is a great yeah. affirmation of this book as a whole and like his ability to pull this off yes absolutely lesser hands this would not work but you have a whole universe. <laughs> 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 Your book. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I was. Uh, I wrote that next to the um, on page two forty three at the it says. Thus, I was born on January first, nineteen sixty eight. Will be able to die again on January first, nineteen sixty eight. That's what I call complete universal harmony. To die the hour and minute you were born, after passing through your whole life twice, from one end to the other and back again. <laughs> yeah. Boom. Well, yeah. What page are you on, Brian? What page are you on? Uh, two forty-three. Okay. Uh, two forty-three. I went to two fifty-three. Okay. The, mus the muscle I had taken it was wearing off yes. as I was reading that, so I was in this weird state. <laughs> mm -mm. But, but no, it made me think of the singularity of a Big Bang, and then they're supposed yeah. to say everything's shrinking back and collapses and collapsed with into itself, and then if you're looking at if you. Uh, Basically, the entire existence of everything is just a, really just a flash, even though it is an infinite amount of time. It's weird stuff to think about. It's like uh, that, that, uh, that true detective line, time is a circle. <laughs> time is a flat circle. That's what it is. That's what it is. Now, so I'm bringing my dumb, like, half-drunken ideas to this. Like, what, what were some of your thoughts on this weird, this is a weird, weird section. I can't make sense of it. This whole, the whole section? Yeah, I mean, just... <laughs> um, so what did you think of everything and everything in it? I feel like that guy on uh, Saturday Night Live that questions about, so how, how does this movie compare to every movie ever? <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. There's okay, so I have, by the way, I have the Bulgarian edition with me, just I thought it was. Oh, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. Yes, I've been... Doing some comparative reading. Bulgarian you, yeah. and English, can, I ask, but... can I ask you one question for the Bulgarian yes. to English? Yes. Uh, page in the English version is page two forty six. Okay. And it has the list. Yes. And number five on the list is foot wraps of unbleached calico. Okay. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, you know yeah, that, that was a little idea. odd. I that remember. Is, that is a, I mean, it has socks. It says socks in parentheses, but. I just yes, love the... Because the Bulgarian is <laughs> thank you to American and in parentheses to wrap you. So um, American is a kind of cloth, but thank you. I have no idea. I think it must be some sort of uh, okay. footwear oh. or... Yeah, so I don't know, a... but it's definitely an antiquated word. Yeah, it was, And it was the whole really list neat. looks... And if it looks like it's been reproduced almost exactly from a photograph or... Right, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. Like I remember seeing that because we... we... I don't know if we had the copy of the book per se, but we probably had like the PDF to like to check the layout on stuff. Mm -hmm. so yes, that we try and do. Oh, that's so awesome! You can go back and forth to both of them. Yeah, that's got to be interesting. Have you? Have you? Is there anything about that that you've noticed or like that you're gonna give Angela props for, or that you? I think she's done an amazing job, yeah. a phenomenal job, really. I mean, I cannot imagine the kind of hard work, intellectual, linguistic, that goes into, inter well, it goes into translation 
by default, but this particular book, because it's so fragmentary, because it's so grounded in politics, in sociology, in all sorts of ideological language, mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's, it's been, I think it, she did a phenomenal job. Yeah, I totally agree. I think it, I mean, she's got, there's so much trust when you start reading one of her translations where, you know, she knows what she's doing. She's thought about it. There are difficulties with every book and things that you can quibble over eventually and whatever, but like she, she, instills such a, such an amount of uh of trust and belief in what she's doing and you feel her ability to write this and to render it and to understand what's going on and to make it work in english in a way that's like just as evocative as as probably the original yes absolutely i really admire her as a translator and i think she she does a great job yeah yeah absolutely there was so i want to go back for one second to that section you were talking about brian the living forward and then back and this is um this is for people who are, are long-time listeners. Wait, so hold on. Before going forward and back, the title of my essay was Adventures in Space-Time. Oh, nice, nice. And so I got completely <laughs> eviscerated. Look, I, I was on top exactly of this shit, it. man. This was 2011. I had it. And I got told, no, you can't do it. Fuck them, dude. Fuck that. The All right, God sorry, a, go ahead. The God is a boson part, and the part where he writes, um, a while back under one of my pen names, I published a novel based on the atomism of... Oh, Lucipius of Miletus and the Democritus of Abdera. I screwed up. Yeah, was that, was that real? This, I don't know. I couldn't find it. Okay. But, but like, but this is, this is basically Frazan's book. This ties in an invented part, like almost exactly. Oh. Like with the idea of the atomism and the atomic novel of opening lines floating in the void. Like that sounds just like mm -hmm. something out of the invented part. Like have you lifted that up there? I totally believe in it. And there's like, this was a wholly serious experiment but it was taken more as a postmodern joke, grasp in terms of its metaphorics rather than its physics. Physicists don't read novels, mm -hmm. which disappointed me greatly and caused me to withdraw from publishing for a decade or so. And that, that sounds exactly like you could you could see that paragraph in in the invented part, and it would make sense still. Yeah, I could see that. Or like a variation on it, but so I have a I have a question for you. If you were going to if you're going to teach this book, and I don't know what the course would be called or whatever, but what would you want your your students to get out of a book like this? How would you how would you approach it with them? You know, I'd probably have to teach them quite a bit about Eastern European history, 20th century Eastern European history, even you know, some more recent European history and Eastern European history in particular, a little bit about mythology, you'd be surprised, or maybe you already know that American <laughs> students, undergraduates don't have a foundation in Western literature and the classics of okay. Western literature. So I'd probably have to teach them a little bit about mythology and ancient Greek mythology, but also you know, there are recurring themes. But in particular, would you focus on like late socialism or or just the general, like this is where Bulgaria is on a map? Like would it be- Yeah, it probably good? start there, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When yeah. people ask me where I'm from and I say Bulgaria, they're not always sure where that is. So I have okay. to specify, well, it's in Eastern Europe. Well, where's that? So, <laughs> <laughs> like Germany? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Uh, oh, man. No, you know, I don't know how I would teach it. So believe it or not, I might teach it in a course on, and if that studies mythology in contemporary, uh, modern, okay. and contemporary literature, because it's so, it's structured around the Minotaur and, and this foundational myth of the Minotaur is kind of the thread that mm -hmm. runs through the entire text, right? It gives it structure, it gives it the narrative, it gives it the imagery, and then all of these, the various, the kind of versions of, of the Minotaur from the cow to the, to, you know, the gas mask, to the little boy, to Theseus, to the way that the narrator and th conflate is conflated with, the Minotaur, and so it's. So I think I might, I might teach this in a course on mythology in modern yeah, contemporary I just, literature. I was just asking selfishly because I'm, I'm doing some teaching and writing, not necessarily with reading of texts, but I always look at things of how would I use this as a teaching tool, and mm -hmm. this just seems so challenging because there's, like you said, so many different parts and echoes, and I mean, pick your poison on this, and you can. Yes. There's, there's and so it is that, long, you know, it is long for undergraduates to read, honestly. Dude, my under, don't say things like that. I think my <laughs> undergraduates listen to this, and that's bullshit. You're supposed to read 500-page books every week, and they should never complain again. <laughs> like, <Yes. laughs> because that's how it is, right? 
right? Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah, exactly. See? I think mean, you're absolutely right. Yes, but I don't. I don't teach the books that we use in this class in the way that you're talking about. Because the way that you're talking about it would be legitimate, like teaching of the book. We use mm -hmm, it more right. like the intro to the idea of how things are translated and a general like survey of like contemporary literature and how different options that exist and how it's written and how it's like how their different aesthetical aesthetic ideas can come about through throughout the world and connect to one another even if like their languages are completely different so it's like a totally different approach where you have to have like a shitload of text and less like of the close reading because otherwise it's like the distant reading of Franco Moretti sort of idea right. of like we have right. to look at the whole scheme otherwise it's hard for them to talk about certain aspects of like world trends because like you say they haven't read many things and that's mm -hmm. I don't know whose fault that is just as a thing yes yes yeah no for sure I mean I did teach excerpts of another Bulgarian foundational Bulgarian text actually late 19th century text by Ganyu I did teach in my literary translation workshop nice. and we only read a couple of chapters but that's fundamentally how do you translate a text that's so well remote in time but also culturally specific do you put footnotes do you gloss what do you do and so definitely I mean I can see how you can teach this text in a translation course right 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 exactly yeah I'm just trying to defend my 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 forcing students to read like so much so much there is no defense for that <laughs> there, are, no, there are very good 50,000 word texts that you could be choosing they weren't published um, last year and that's a wonderful they form how many how many words were uh fever doing? <laughs> like, hey i think that was maybe twenty-five thousand words you could have given fever doing would have loved you i i will withhold my my snarky <laughs> comment um no, so I have a question. What do you, okay, we could jump ahead. There's I, there's a parts of this that, like I like talking about the time thing and I need to talk about my favorite page at some point. Yes. But you mentioned the idea of the Minotaur sort of merging with him um, and that idea. What do you make of this, the ending exactly? Like especially on page 276 and 77 where uh, it says like a short, short double-edged sword is found and all like mm -hmm. an unusually valuable object from antiquity. And then there's like, I felt the strange sort of excitement. Yes. I had a complicated relationship with that writer without having known him. I had always felt personally robbed while reading him. And before that, there's a bit where he's like in the basement talking about how mm -hmm. someone's going to kill him. And it is like sort of this merging of those two things. But I'm curious of what you make out of it because I'm not sure that there's like a distinctive, I mean, it's very quantum ending, I suppose, where mm -hmm. there's possibilities of how you could read and observe it. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, the way I read it is that, well, the narrator and the minotaur have become one or if, or in any case i think the narrator is similar to theseus who finds the minotaur but it turns out that theseus is very similar to the minotaur and the minotaur says that theseus reminds him of himself so there's convergence of the three voices and so these narrative threads come together and they continue on in another universe you know it's like they're, they're missing they're gone right the scene of the crime is there. There is no actual crime. There's no blood on this double-edged sword. Right. It's only the sign of kind of the material sign of their existence. But I think they've continued on in another story. So that's I think that's kind of they've they've invented another story and and they're moving, inhabiting another story, another corridor, another building. So I think they've right. just changed location. Yeah, I I can totally buy into that. That or like it goes backwards then too. Oh, it goes backwards. That's right, exactly. Because that's another recurring through. theme, right? Going backwards in time and getting younger and younger and, and reliving your birth. I that the part about nostalgia was is God. There are so many parts of this that really are right in my wheelhouse. The nostalgia part about recreating like the uh, Bulgarian city of thirty years ago and having it like be that that thing because people are nostalgic nowadays and they want to go yes. back. Really struck home too, especially in light of um, a different thing that I've obsessed with, which was uh, the most recent uh, Twin Peaks. Uh, no, I did it. No. Oh, I, I, was holding it. I was holding it inside until right now. I gave you a whole season with no Twin Peaks references. <laughs> <laughs> but like, finally, but that, yeah. and finally, I get my one. But it was, it's a whole, the whole show is, a lot of that show is structured around the idea. I'm gonna like, go make a drink. Go ahead, <laughs> talk about Twin Peaks. <laughs> he's actually gone. For people who are living to listen to podcasts, he's gone. But there is an idea in that, in that season, of, or the new season of Twin Peaks, about like as a, as a creator trying to have nostalgia, how to return to something, how to deal with this sort of obsession with nostalgia when you can't really ever go back and you can't capture that and how do you how do you interact with that and there is a little it's not exactly the same but it reminds me of that like now that 
that have watched that show, which I think is the best thing I've ever seen. Um, it's just amazing to, anytime that nostalgia comes up, I have like a more complicated relationship to the idea of nostalgia than I did prior to watching it. And, I, and even within this, I have the same same kind of feeling of like, it's, it's there's so many more layers to this base kind of primal idea. Um, it's not easy enough to reject and it's not easy to like go down that rabbit hole of just like wanting things to be like the past because they yes. can't. Absolutely. Yeah, so like that, the, the living museum of socialism is fascinating, the whole city which yeah. lives and reenact socialism and communism. It's really interesting. She said her favorite show is Twin Peaks, too. Oh, cool. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what we've been talking about. Right? Changed, changed everything. <laughs> Forget like the fall of socialism and a whole new regime coming in. Yeah. Twin Peaks, it's, every, it's all, just, it's everything. You know, book could actually just be part of the Twin Peaks. Yeah, movie. well, speaking, you know, they're shooting a film. To, oh, the narrator thinks they're shooting a film anyway. <laughs> so there you go. Yeah. And that's that's part that. of, like, the Audrey theme of the most recent the most recent uh, series. <laughs> I'm done. I'm done. I have I'm not done. seen it. I have not seen that season, I admit. Greatest thing I've ever seen. So I do want to point out one thing for sure, is that I think next week uh, Santiago has been writing the weekly post about this for the website, is going to come on to talk about writing about it and reading it and his his process of working on this particular project for us. And one of the things that he honed in on very early was that uh, um, was that the whole book is set up as kind of a spiral. And he was obsessed with the idea of the spiral within the narrative as well. And of course, on 268, there's a whole thing of like a vertical labyrinth that unwinds in a spiral and talking about DNA yes. and labyrinths. So really like what feeds right into his sort of interpretation. I just want to give him a little shout out on the, the podcast and tell people you should be reading those things that he's writing. They're great. Um, his weekly posts and uh, he will be on here to, to talk about them as well. And you know, now that I think about it on Twin Peaks, um, that box that they bury the girl in, it's kind of like a time capsule, it's kind of like right? And he jumps on the time capsule to try to stop it from being buried because he's trying to stop time. Yeah, yeah. So, well, yeah, well, maybe, well, in the last episode of the most recent season, they go back in time and fix everything. You know what? <laughs> Twin Peaks is everything. You're right. You're right. <laughs> There are lots of people chiming in about Twin Peaks on the, on the chat right really now, know. and you're all talking about how it's the greatest thing ever. I, it's no <laughs> secret. I don't have anything against Twin I know, Peaks. I, I just haven't seen it, so I have to so, Do you want to know myself. what my favorite one is? My favorite page? Yes, we're it dying, is. chat. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> sure. Make this album my favorite page. It's the Quantum of Aging on 251. <laughs> this is 100% like the, the page that mo means the most to me. Mm -hmm. um, because it has the it's been about getting old, but there's the the two paragraphs in particular that are right in the middle. There's some sort of grammar for aging. Childhood and youth are full of verbs. You can't sit still. Everything in you is growing, gushing forth, developing. Later, the verbs are gradually replaced by the nouns of middle age. Kids, cars, work, family, the substantial things of the substantives. Growing old is an adjective. We enter into the adjectives of old age, slow, boundless, hazy, cold, or transparent like glass. Amazing. And then there's the mathematics of aging, a simple set theory. We change the world's proportions over the years. Those younger than we are grow ever more numerous, while the number of those older than we are declines menacingly. Aging requires a certain audacity. It may not be audacity, but resignation. Those two paragraphs alone, like if I read that on an opening of any submission to us, I'd be like, yep, yeah, we're going to publish this book. We'll figure out the rest of it later. Don't care. I love those two paragraphs. Great. I hope some of my students are watching. This is a good lesson for them. <laughs> now they know what to put the foreground. Yes, talking, exactly. you know, if you're talking to a middle-aged white male who's an editor, talk about getting old and, and, mm -hmm. and feeling like you're going to die. That'll <laughs> really feel good to them. And have an interesting failing marriage <laughs> in your plot. Yes. <laughs> Can't make sure, lose. Make sure it feels like they're like bound by the scriptures of time and society. Yes, mixing literature and science, right? That's... Yeah, I mean, physics and liter literature, it's a good combination. I think that's a good, I think that's a fun way of talking about, cause it, I mean, it's, there's there's only so much, so many ways that you can talk about getting old and like the process of that and the feelings, but this idea of using grammar in that way, I hadn't seen before and I really like that. Mm -hmm. Like yes, that, no. that, is that sort of, it sort of makes sense. Even if it's it obviously it's sort of making that up, but it still works really well for me. Yes, no, for sure. And it's something that you can really relate to, regardless of, of what culture you come from. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I think it's very universal. Yeah, absolutely. 
there's a, that that relates to to the part like a few pages earlier on 241 where he talks about like his great moment is like sitting on the steps before anything's happened and like that that sort of possibilities yeah. of the future exactly. yes yes with the girl who's sitting with her back towards yeah. him at the piano that i think that's my favorite image from that novel yeah. And at the end, as she turns around and he recognizes her, it's really wonderful. For me, it really is a kind of the highlight or the epiphany at the end of the text. It's so good. It is. It's really good. Okay, here we go, Kati. <laughs> yeah. Is that similar? And yeah, how does that yeah. how does that work in in Bulgarian? Yeah. Is it verbs, adjectives, nouns? It probably is, right? Yeah, absolutely. It is the same. Yes. Oh, it's great. Yes. Cool. Yes. Very good. A funny uh, real-world connection I had in this section is on page 245. Um, it starts with ellipses, and it mm -hmm. uh, says, but in the end, you don't do it. Yes. And then it, ta it talks about having to go to the barber shop and have all your hair cut off, and you're watching it falling to the mm -hmm. floor, and you're crying. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was at a, I think it was 2010 AWP in Chicago, and I watched uh, Carol Meso give a reading. Uh, super packed house. There's yeah. like 600 people there. And she was reading these very small um, short stories, maybe 2,000 words or less. Yeah. And uh, one of the short stories she read was about uh, a soldier that was getting his hair cut. Mm. And she was talking about the hair falling off of the soldier and then linking it to soldiers dying and things falling to the floor, and then the, the soldier, uh, the young cadet kind of like weeping. And then when she finished, I just remember when she finished the story, you know, it's a room of like 600 people, this big auditorium, and it's just completely silent. And like, mm -hmm. nobody says anything. And you just hear somebody go, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole place just like erupted in like, clapping and like whooping like what a good story oh. and this this paragraph is exactly the same image the same thing she conjured up like i just i just love that people completely different from completely walks of life can have such a powerful impactful image like it it reminded me of what a treat it was to sit in that audience and hear this wonderful reading that she gave and then here i just got goosebumps reading about the the hair falling down the tears and so wonderful that just Human beings, man, we're all human. I love it. Yes, yeah. Well, I mean, that's also empathy, right? Yes, yeah. it's empathy. And the whole exactly. book is, this book is about empathy, which is also the the art of the novelist in general. The art of the writer is to create that sensation in the reader. Correct. Yeah, and it's so fun how he plays around with that idea throughout, where it starts out almost like almost as if empathy is like a a magical uh, sci-fi ability for him to go into people's worlds and embed himself. And like, then it becomes like, that's a psychology of empathy. Oh yeah. You found the perfect quote. Um, but then he like, then it sort of evolves into like, he can't can no longer embed, but he can write these things and can empathize through people in that way. And that this, the book makes that possible. It kind of, I mean, it's another one of these, like it's a testament to the idea of writing. Like if you, if you can write well and you can write a book, that can change things for people because it allows you to have this this experience. Yes. It's a physics Recent. book, right? So which section like, you read it? Oh, sure. Uh, page two forty nine at the very bottom. Uh, it says empathy is unlocked in some people through pain. For me, it happens more often through sorrow. Mm -hmm. is, yeah, is, I can. I kind of get that. Like. Exactly. Well, it's the connection with the Minotaur throughout everything, yeah. right? He's always looking at from trying to look at through the Minotaur's eyes, not Theseus's eyes, right? right. Mm -hmm. And you can think of the Minotaur as the other, right? This kind of a generalized figure of the other, but the writer inhabits the other as well. So I really like that that he's he's looking through kind of this through the eyes or through the perspective of an ostracized other who is different, inherently different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Someone growing up in the United States, I love the idea of they always identified with the Indians and not with the cowboys. Yeah. Like yeah. that was a wonderful, Clearly. like you should have empathy for them. Yeah. These are people that have been mm -hmm. like, but no, in, in our movies, they're the bad guys, right? Yeah. The cowboys are the good guys, go kill them. Like, and that was a great yes. that, that idea of empathy and, and thinking of the other, yeah, yeah it's the, the different parallels he does on that. I was, I was really impressed with all throughout this book. Yes. 
are there other Bulgarian books that like lead into this from your perspective of like from an aesthetic aesthetic standpoint or just generally speaking like he's this seems so out of out of nowhere in terms of like I mean it's so impressive it's such an interesting concept it's a great way of doing it and the other Bulgarian literature I've read I really like wait it's I've out of nowhere seen... because Bulgarians can't write good literature is that what no, you're saying no I mean, that the no, other, that's what, that's other, what you yeah. just said I the other, think. The other yeah. Bulgarian books I've that's read really, and they've been published that's really mean Chad <laughs> Are, are not like this. I, apo I apologize um, for him. Did you just, you recently published Wolf Hunt, is that right? No, no, we read it. Oh, you read, okay, read it. Okay. my class read that. Yeah, they read that whole book. And then we talked to oh, Angela and she explained to them like, because that book's history is, I mean, the, the structure of how it's written is crazy because he wrote it in two different times. And so there's like one part of it. And then there's a second part that he inserted that was like more of the anti-communist part. And he kept telling like the communist government, he's like, oh, there's going to be a part that's coming later that's like pro-communist, don't worry. But um, <laughs> but like the book, there's a lot of things that just don't make sense in terms of plot and there's structural problems because he wrote it in this weird sort of way. It's a book that has like an engine on page like 21 that never pays off. It's a, it's this very strange book. But my, I made my century that it's like 600 pages long. Like, I don't know why anyone takes my classes. Like, they <laughs> do you ever, do you guys, me. Wow. Do you ever, do you guys look at the Rate My Professor? Is that thing still out? The no. RateMyProfessor.com? I'm sure they have evaluations, right? No, I've heard the evaluations. There was like a Hot or Not <laughs> website for professors when I was in, this <laughs> I is like back in like 2003 or something, but there used to be like a RateMyProfessor.com. There but, is, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, he gets he gets two blood fists, not five. Or You would get zero, you would get zero <laughs> for making people read 600-page <laughs> Bulgarian text. It, I think I reach on easiness in there. <laughs> What's wrong with you? They enjoyed it, man. They love that book. They actually did love that book. Okay, well, that's <laughs> good then. They give me right. good books. It's a good book. But was there, is there, yeah, is there anything else that like, like. So I'm going to admit some of my own ignorance. I haven't really kept up. I wish I had kept up with contemporary Bulgarian literature, but yeah. I, you know, read once in a while something recommended. So I read this book because it was such a sensation in Bulgaria and was very popular. But I don't know where it's coming from in terms of contemporary influences, but I think some parts of it evoke some older Bulgarian narratives, early 20th century. Um, mm -hmm. I would say Jordan Yovkov is one of the authors I thought of. He writes, he's primarily famous for his short stories, which track kind of the Bulgarian 19th century past in this semi-mythological, semi-folklore way, but really beautifully written, but have the, have, they have these settings in small towns or villages. Right. And he's pretty well known in Bulgaria, so I detect some of that in his in Gospodinov's writing. But I'm not I'm not sure what I mean. Other than the Western European, right? You can think of right. a number of Western European influences, but I'm not sure what particularly Bulgarian literary kind of impact I can detect here. Other than early 20th century, some of the classics, the Bulgarian classics. And it's kind of cool to think of it not being necessarily influenced by other Bulgarian authors, but like from Western European traditions and bringing that into Bulgaria and importing that and, and transforming it as he's as he's writing it. But I really, yeah, I I mean, we've read, we've published, I don't know, I think it's eight uh, Bulgarian books now, maybe it's seven, six, but it's it's a number and like, they're all really fantastic, but they're all very different. And like, there's a sense of like being, uh, and this is this is true not just of Bulgaria but of other countries, um, especially in Eastern Europe, but throughout the world, of being somewhat outside or adjacent to the tradition that we're used to in America. So it's like it's kind of there, but like different. It's just different and a different yes. take. Like there's um the one of the books, Milan Ruskov's uh, <clears throat> Thrown into Nature is a uh, picaras that has like sort of Don Quixote like ideas behind it, but it's also like just kind of batshit and like very funny and like just irreverent and like the whole idea is that this guy's going around this 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 uh doctor is going around and convincing everyone they need to use smoke for everything the smoking kills all ills that you have to have a smoke enema will make you better forever you can cure cancer with smoke like all this and it's mm -hmm. really wild and like irreverent and i've been doing a, cig a cigarette juice cleanse there you go yeah uh, exactly yep. i feel i feel awful <laughs> But I'm gonna, I'm getting better. I'll get better. But I feel awful right now. But it's fun. It's like taking these ideas and like seeing it through yeah, new very lines. Very brittle fingernails. <laughs> and yellow. Everything's yellow. Yeah.
your skin turns a certain tone. Yeah, I think also, but they're also, I would say, not just Western European, but Eastern European and Balkan influences. Yeah. I'm thinking Milorad Pavic, Dictionary yeah. of the Hazars. I don't know if you've read, and you probably have Thea Albrecht, The Tiger's Wife, which has a similar to it. So Danilo Kish and... Yeah, there are a lot, I think there's, yes, there's a lot of Eastern European and Central European or even Balkan influences here. So it's it's a little bit of a pastiche and I think he's going for it. That's it's This is the kind of fragmentary mixing of genres, mixing of images, words with yeah. pictures, et cetera, et cetera. So I think he's going for it. Oh yeah, yeah. It's spectacular. It is, Truly. yeah, it is. There's no one like that. I, I like how we our comparisons are the back, so we want to throw in some names so that you get keywords. So are lame. Dave Eggers, Tom McCarthy, and Dubrovsky <laughs> Grushik. Although Ugrushik is really spot on. That works. Oh, that yeah, of course. Works. That is absolutely you're right. That's, yes. Now, but Dave Eggers and Tom McCarthy and uh, Gus Padina were all finalists for the same prize. Oh, perfect. Oh, wow. Yes. Um, yeah. And I don't remember who won, but I think this book won over the other ones. But they were all like. The, yeah. It was the um, which one called the Strago Prize. Oh, really? No, I don't. It, it, I don't think it's it did. Either. I think it was just a finalist. He was nominated, and there are only five finalists. So yeah, they can impressive. be from anything. They can be from any any language translated into Italian. So yes, exactly. Yes, and in fact, they just today announced the 2017 shortlist of the oh, really? Strago Europeo. Who's on it? Anyone? Um, you know, there's, I think, I remember reading it briefly. There is um, an Irish novel. I think there is, I can't remember now. I'm, I can look it up, but. Uh, yeah, yeah. It doesn't, we're, yes, but they just announced it today, the finalists. We're announcing the whole Best Translated Book Award long list. Uh, to, if you're watching this on YouTube, we're announcing it tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. If you're listening to this on the podcast, it's already been announced and you can find it. Um, but I'm not giving you guys any. Any ans any answers to who's on it? They probably don't care. They probably don't. No, I thought people do care. They, they, <laughs> they, we used good. to have a, a competition where if you could guess, and I screwed it up because I was just we didn't get the list until late and it's been busy times. But um, if you could guess all twenty five books on the long list, you received every open letter book until you died, or the oh, person wow. had business. Oh, <laughs> like it was a, a game. Um, so this time we'll have to do it for a short list that you'll get like X number this of years. Twenty seventeen. Yeah. Let's see, uh, Baghdad, Frankenstein, monster thing. That's a 2018 book, man. I oh, wrote a whole post damn. based on how people missed <laughs> it. Sorry, no, no books for you life read this. <laughs> uh, The Perfect Nanny. No, also 2018. <laughs> I'm just so current. I'm so current. What can I say? I don't know. <laughs> the Bible. They're, they're always Bible. translating that every year. It gets translated. True, true, true. Anyways, I don't. Is there any other section that you guys wanted to talk about in here that? No, I would, I'm, what I think most impresses me with this is the ability to somehow infuse humor throughout all of this. It really, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like it, just to do that in any in any form is very hard to do, and then to pull it off in this is it's a magic trick. So I love that it starts off with a magic trick because that's that's its own magic trick. It seems like to be funny throughout all this. I was planning on taking a class over at Writers and Books to learn how to be humorous, <laughs> yeah. like. How to write humor into my writing. like I I just it, I laughed when I read the line on two fifty four I can't stand categorical people when mm. like, the whole thing he's making lists and categories and right but that's when he was twenty nine I guess so he you know he learned I, he learned I, to learn to grow up from that I guess I don't know I forget this is one of my favorite sections too with all the the age the ages after each little each little bit and like what you'd be at that so you were talking you were talking about smoking right yes. fun funny version. Yeah. A guy decides to quit smoking using regressive hypnotherapy. He starts going backward towards the time before he started smoking to awaken the memory of his clean lungs. The hypnotherapy is so successful that the regression goes so far back that he not only quits smoking, but he also starts wetting his bed and not being able to say R. <laughs> mm. Yes. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. My apologies. No, you didn't. I don't know. No, no, I was just agreeing. But I, you know, it's funny that I don't find it as funny. I mean, I think it's because it's too close to home that I really empathize that to me, that's part of my own past of my own history. Sure. And even though just like, like Gospodino, the biographical person and like the literary character here, I grew up in, in communist society in the eighties, about a decade after 
the narrator here, but still I have distinct memories of everything that he's describing and they're the memories of a child, but still. So to me, I identify with the character and so I don't find it that funny. I think it's dead serious. And, but I can see your point of view completely. It's just that how our own background, our own history informs the way we read and the way we relate to a text. There's, there's, there's also, uh, it maybe, maybe not funny, but there's a, there's not a, lightness is probably the wrong word too, but there's an energy or a verve to the writing that makes it, that takes it out of being just dead on the page serious. And yes, I mean, like, it absolutely. might not be funny, but it's like, it's not that, there are books that are describing the time period in, in pseudo historical ways it's that are playful, like not right? playful. It's playful. Right. I yeah. think it's playful. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I, think that's I love more. that about the book. Right. And that's what, for me, makes it bearable because then it's it would be, like you said, if it were a dead serious history of the period would be boring and would be just um, painful to read. Yeah, yep, exactly. Exactly. The other yeah, one that, the one that I, I have didn't... favorite other quotes. <laughs> yeah, there are... The labyrinth is really, I love the labyrinth. Yes, the internal labyrinth, you know, the, the bodies. We're made of labyrinths, right? The corporeal labyrinth. Yes, yeah. yes, 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 love that. The, the part with the cardiac exam was the part where I was just like, oh, no, that's a little close to home. I'm going you know, <laughs> <laughs> to make me yeah. uncomfortable. Oh. <laughs> and then oh. the after it's describing, like, uh, not being able to hear out of the ear. And it's like, oh, oh, what are you, why are you doing this to me? My favorite part about the, the labyrinth of the guts and stuff, uh, my wife does surgery and I asked her like, how do you guys know how to put people's insides back in? And she's like, oh, it's easy. You just put them back in. They know where to go. Like, <laughs> like, they're pre-folded like a map. No, because like, I always thought like, you know, like the intestines, like are you, how do you, is there like a- Arrange them, right? <laughs> like, how do you, like, no, just put them in and they'll go where they go. They, know, they know where to go. Fair enough. Yeah. I, there's one moment, a wonderful cultural moment, and moment on page 270, top of 270, where he talks about the food, the sweets, the pastries, baniti, burek, saradias, all the winding filo dough sweets of the Orient. And that in particular is kind of a, a very vibrant image to me because I can picture the winding in banita, which is the filo dough Thai, and then the other, the kind of the sweet, sweet and savory oh, yeah. food. Bulgarian, but also Mediterranean. It's it's again. I mean, I had never thought of it as a labyrinth. But even when you look at it, when you cut it, it looks like a labyrinth. It's, it has walls and corridors, and and you can get lost in it, like just trying to yeah. to fish out the cheese. And so it's that's a really beautiful image to me. And are the sweets sweetened with with honey? I assume because it goes straight to bees from there. No, well, the, maybe, maybe the, uh, it, he doesn't say baklava. Baklava is traditionally made sure. with honey yeah. in Bulgaria, so no. But saradia, I think, could be made with, maybe with honey, sugar. But that's a good point, absolutely. Then he goes to beets. Yeah, I hate reading stuff that's written by somebody this smart, because you got to really kind of consider everything and where it's arranged. <laughs> <laughs> the, the hype. <laughs> you know, I had to, so I was curious. I admit, there here's a teaching moment. So I was really curious whether it's Angela glossing the three words in in italics because these are such Bulgarian concepts. So I was wondering if the following line were a stealth gloss on her part, right. and in fact, and it's not. It's in there in the Bulgarian that he modifies, he qualifies, and so it's really it could have been a stealth gloss, but it's not. That's interesting. Yeah, because it would it would seem like it could go either way, right? Yes, exactly. Because otherwise, you don't know what these words are. They're foreign words. They're foreign concepts, but nothing else. Without the following line, you wouldn't know what they are. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah, you'd just be like, oh, that's another one of these italicized words. It's funny. I have to teach uh, tomorrow. We're going over Compass by Matteo Sinard, which is all about the Orient and uh, mm -hmm. and about this kind of uh, of. Um, being both attracted to and obsessed with and encountering the other. So it ties in nicely to this book at the end. And the guy's dying in bed. It's all, all these things. Everything in this book seems to be one of these books that like hits on your, the rest of your life as you read it. 
like which doesn't yes, exactly exactly always happen but it's part of the structure of this and also compass has the same thing with images throughout it, it has a lot of images that show up that they it's usually things that are from books but or that are representations of arabic culture but nevertheless it's like another book with images that has this sort of this sort of understanding like it's an interesting Interesting to me that I like I'm reading this and having all these other things happen mm -hmm. around it. That, that's mm -hmm. what it's yes, and, yes. And most importantly, uh, Lit Hub said they like the the cover of it. So that that cover is <laughs> shit, dude. That cover. Oh, is shit. oh who, uh, yeah. How did you come up with this cover? So this is beautiful. I really like it. Oh, uh, like it was yellow. It was literally. Uh, I don't remember why yellow, except usually like if there's too many books that are like red or blue that are in that given season, we try and variate them. But the yellow seemed to work really well. But the idea was to make it look like a minotaur, but also fragmented. Those yes. are like the two mm -hmm. things. And so uh, Nate took that pretty literally, I guess, and took a la uh, minotaur and fragmented it because we found pictures of minotaurs that you could play around with, right? Um, and there is a different version of this that for whatever reason showed up online like last week, like out of nowhere, it was showed up everywhere in like Amazon and on our like our distributors page. And it was not our, um, it was not our original, it's not this cover. It was the one that earlier version, it was never released to the public, but it was like, everything's way more spaced out. The text is in different places. And it just like suddenly resurfaced. And apparently um, from, from uh, the chat room, um, Kaya is informing me that the reason we chose yellow is because yellow equals nostalgia. Yes, I was going to say, really kind of recalls melancholy. That's, yeah. Yeah. that's why she's the yeah. brains of the operation. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> like, that's right. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, dude, it was like a picture of a minotaur, and I don't know, yellow's cool. I was like, no, it's fucking nostalgia. Jesus Christ. Like, who is keeping this press on the rails? <laughs> Not me. Um, do you have a favorite line, Brian? There were a lot from here, but um, I'm going to go way back, not in this section, to uh, page 216. Okay. And if we go way back to page 216, um, he mm -hmm. says at the, at the top paragraph there, before I left, she gave me her favorite dinosaur. I've always kept it with me. I imagine how mm -hmm. someday in the future, when she is telling stories to her own children, she'll start with a line. My father and the dinosaurs disappeared at the same time, which is a good beginning, or rather, end. There you go. Which yes. then? Yes. And at, and yeah. at the very, 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 very end, we got a cute little dinosaur here. Mm -hmm. That's a yes. Line, dinosaur. Right. And the line. And the line beginning. My father and the dinosaurs died out at the same time. If you want to read this book, you got to be very careful and pay attention to stuff because it all. He doesn't. He doesn't throw stuff in here for nothing. Yes. Yeah, no. Like it's definitely not it's very. I mean, I know this term is probably not quite relevant, but it's very tightly plotted. For as fragmentary as it seems, it's very tightly plotted and structured. It is. Yes. Yeah, and then absolutely. also, it gives voice to the daughter. It's the daughter who begins the next narrative at the end. So that's mm -hmm. she's the voice of the future. She's the next storyteller. Absolutely. And of course, children are minotaurs as well. And so maybe she's. This is the new minotaur. Too. And it, it could it's be the first time as a child that it could be some hope because yeah, children are maligned and yeah, children's not a happy thing throughout most of this until we get to his own child. Not, yeah, ways. exactly, exactly. Yeah, I don't even have. I've read all my favorite lines, so I'm not going to use one this time, unless it was like, "We are labyrinths. <laughs> <laughs> we are made of labyrinths." Sorry, that's what it is. That's always it's fantastic. Really yeah, that's great. So. Um, thank you. And I, I'm going to, I will, I will, for everyone who's listening, we will be having one more episode about this. It's just to talk to Santiago about his writings and about the book one last time. We'll see if Gargi will come on for a minute too. Um, I'm not sure if he will or not. We'll see if he can come on here and, and chat with us as well. Um, and then after that, we'll be announcing the next season of the two month review, which will focus on Fox by Dubravka Ugrashik. You can order it now. And if you use the code two month, you'll get 20% off from our website. And that goes for all of the books that have been in the two month review so far. So Physics of Sorrow, Death in Spring, Select the Stories of Mercy Rotoreda, Thomas Johnson bestseller, and The Invented Part, all 20% off if you just use the code two, the number two, and then month. Um, and then after that, we'll be changing things up, but we'll save that announcement for a later date. Um, but as always, you can always check in at 3%. You can sign up for our newsletter. You can get all of the information there. You can also follow us on 
Twitter at open uh, open underscore letter or at Chad W Post. That's way easier to remember. And at Brian Wood underscore. Do you use Twitter? I don't. Okay, I didn't think I couldn't find you on there. No. But where can people find what you're doing? Or if they um, want to post? either Facebook or academia.edu or just Oberlin's webpage. Oberlin's webpage just talks yeah. about the um, Russian formalist. Uh, yes. <laughs> Oh, maybe they haven't updated and who she's knows? She's got a killer score on ratemyprofessor.com. So she's doing a good job teaching, I'll tell you that. Watch her, out, watch out. Her students love her. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much again for doing this. Thank you, Chad and Brian. It was fun. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. For sure. Any last words of labyrinths or minotaurs? It's ending. The novel ends with the late April snow, just as we are in mid-April, and it was snowing in Ohio earlier today. So we're kind of at the end of the novel, and, and we're in April, and it's still snowing. That's kind of fitting. Prince died in April, and he has a song, Sometimes It Snows in April. Is that true? <sighs> yes. Big sigh. Rest it's in peace. Spring. 65 degrees on Thursday, guys. 65 <laughs> degrees. Thank <laughs> you.